Hello, everybody. Hi, I'm Ryan Pierce, chair of the Low Residency Visual Studies Program here at PNCA. And I'm happy to welcome you and welcome you back for our second thesis talk, this time from third year student Travis Johnson. Travis will give his talk and then take about 10 minutes uh, of audience questions before adjourning in private with a faculty panel composed of myself and Jay Ponteri and uh, Taka Yamamoto today. As many of you know, this program is built around a robust schedule of visiting artists, which offer our students valuable cold reads and perspectives from the many disciplines, um, from many disciplines and from outside this region. And one of these artists, after her studio visits, um, asked me, what is Travis doing here? And she meant it like, why isn't this guy at Yale or UCLA? Not knowing that this program is clearly the new Yale. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe, why isn't this guy leading his own program? Or just, like, shouldn't he already be a darling of the art world while well on his way to becoming a household name? What is Travis doing here? So I thought for a minute, like, a lot. Travis is expanding his practice from exuberant 2D works that provide some beautiful answers into mixed media sculptures that ask some important and uncomfortable questions. Who is violent on your behalf? Travis is forming his own lexicon, black, rural, working class, even a little sci-fi. Lights in the desert, lights in the sky through a desert dust storm, and the tension of a truck strap, a tool, a keepsake, a promise. Travis is working in his studio like the musician he is, comfortable in his craft, equal parts precision and improvisation. Travis is also building this community through endless studio visits and talks, supporting each of us with generosity and warmth that helps us find a better version of ourselves through our own work. But I didn't say all that to the visiting artist. I was just like, you know, the best artists don't really go to Yale anymore. <laughs> Please welcome Travis Johnson. After that introduction, uh, I, I, could, I could just cry, you know what I mean? I can just cry for the next 40 minutes and then you'll walk out. That's what it is. <laughs> it is, my name is Travis Johnson. It's an honor and a pleasure and a privilege to be here. And each one of you, most of you I know, and we've had beautiful conversations with and beautiful connections with. And so it's, I'm, I'm very grateful. Gratitude is what's in my heart right now. And what I learned many years ago is when you're nervous, you channel those nerves to give all that you have. And so that's what we're going to attempt today. And I think a, a good way to get into the work, I would like to start with a poem. And I would like to share that and then a little bit of, uh, a little bit of the, uh, the thesis, an uh, excerpt of the thesis. And this is a poem that I wrote. Everything that I read today will be work that I wrote, but we'll reference a whole bunch of people. But it's so good to see all of your faces here today in such an honor. Um, so this is Religion and Labor. I was too soon. There we go. Religion and Labor. 4.45 AM. Leather boots laced up strong. Dirty lunchbox. Prayer before sunrise. Iron H-beams. Burning rod at 5.45 AM. The smell of hot metal, steel beams, steel hands. The life of an Iron Man, a closet of prayer, laughter. Building, we build buildings to last for a thousand years. Playing basketball in steel-toed boots. They called him Rev. They called him for prayer. They made their weights from scrap metal. Hammers would beat metal, not tap. PTSD 
from working in the hole. He ain't never been right. He pulled a assault rifle in a knife fight. It was a prison yard with no fence. It's how we ate. It's how we all ate. Pastor Steve got convicted, but his daughter could sing the, those gospel songs. When she sang, I was convinced that I was on my way to heaven, and I was going there for sure. Church melodies floated out of the front door into the neighborhood. Sister Guadalupe sent an oil-soaked handkerchief to Mexico for her daughter to get healing, and it worked. It was my mother's idea. No one was confused. We knew that the devil was alive and well, but God had him in a headlock. Brother Mayorino's voice shook the neighborhood, a 12-gauge shotgun pumping into the back of a white man. We knew that got him because the neighborhood got silent. You know things are bad when the air gets silent. It was long before we found the desert. The desert, the desert silence was much older. It gave us room to watch and pray. Leftover meatloaf and carrots, crackers, limeade, singing, sleeping all the way home, consistency, getting things done, building the fence, feeding the dogs, chasing the sheep, cooking dinner while singing, ritual, working on the car, the bank, Stater Brothers, a load to the dump, prayer meeting, a leaky pipe, provisionally painting our life to get home. The highway got longer each year. Plaid shirts, suspenders, callous hands, tired eyes, a gentle, contagious smile, watching westerns, a ride for a stranger, a ride for a loved one, anointing the sick. The voice way before a note was ever sung, the voice that vibrated the limbs of my childhood, using his hands to get the job done, creating art with no degree, digging the ditch that needed to be dug, no time to think, only time to do. Two days of work in one day's time. 11.45 p.m. The next piece is Black Love. <clears throat> to understand Black Love is to understand the ontological placement of love outside of blackness. White love is an enigmatic thing that is used to aggressively produce an oppressive culture that is completely in contrast to black life, black love, and black existence. To think about and understand black love is to possess the ability to be translucent and to move in an opaque, counter disjointed narrative that to the hegemonic commonality of defined love. Black love is mistakenly perceived as the same as white, the white definition of love. Black love carries an enigmatic trait that is distinctly coded and hidden in plain sight and works as a counterfeit inside a counterfeit culture. Black love lives with life-affirming power. In the edges and margins, it is a full conversation with a glance. It's a loud cackling laughter in a valley of discomfort. It's the hand gesture toward the pot of colored greens. It's fat, it's queer, it's sexual hips and hair, bulging muscles for no apparent reason. It's silent, it's a silence. It's the question, have you eaten today? It's understanding that you don't need words. The silence will explain all the details. Black love dances from darkness into the shadows, out of the shadows, never ending, never beginning, for the preservation of black life. The mystique, is the installation, insulation. Black love moves mountains. Black love is sacred and secret. I'm going to need that later. No, we can't put it too far. <laughs> so I have three images that I want to show. I'll give like 30 seconds to look at them. There's a lot of information. They're really a jumping off place when I came into the program. I did them before I was in the program. And if you can. Uh, just take it in and, and think about the aesthetics. This is what I was like toying with and then I made a hard left. But I'll give um, like 30 seconds on each, each image. <laughs> 